When I came across Warren Buffett, I had the arrogance to think that maybe I was smart as Warren Buffett. I was capable of putting out the same returns as Warren Buffett. So they would name themselves, they would take the name of a well-known firm and, you know, instead of calling themselves Goldman Sachs, they'd call themselves Geldman Zox. Believe it or not, oh. that there would be people who'd be duped by them. You know, the younger you are when you make reputational mistakes, the better you, you people will give you the benefit of the doubt. But the older you are when you make them, the more time it's going to take for people to really kind of like start trusting yeah. people who've worked, quote, on Wall Street as a rip. They, you would have brokers on the 14th, 15th floor who would boast about ripping the client's face off, you know? <laughs> Hi. I'm Steve Clapham. Welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world at large. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Guy Spear is a value investor best known for partnering with Monish Pabrai and paying $651,000 to have lunch with Warren Buffett. Guy's quarter of a million dollar share was clearly a brilliant investment, as he explains in our discussion. And he talks about how Buffett helped him to grow as a person in ways he didn't even want to grow. Remarkably, Guy also explains why he was an idiot, his words, to write one of the investing rules in his book eight years ago, because he's completely changed his mind. He talks about how his father entrusted his life savings to a relatively young and totally inexperienced guy. That colored his approach to running his fund, which is focused on the avoidance of risk. Guy invests in businesses which move at a glacial pace, which means he doesn't need to worry about the stock price from week to week or even month to month. He explains why he prefers to do his own research than to rely on an analyst. And he shares a tip on interviewing management from a former intelligence officer. And this episode is about more than investing. Guy tells his wife he loves her. He talks about the conversations he has with his children. And he explains why he once flew from Zurich to California for dinner. This is a long episode. We didn't split it in two after feedback from the William Green episodes. Yet we only covered half of the subjects I wanted to discuss, even after we went for lunch to continue the conversation. So I hope Guy will be coming back. I haven't asked any of my guests for a second interview. What do you think? Email me at info at behindthebalancesheet.com and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Guy Spear. So, Guy, welcome to the show. I must say, I'm approaching this. I, normally, I'm pretty relaxed when I do these podcasts, but I'm, I've got a little bit of trepidation because I know you're good friends with William Green. And I know he prepares for days for an interview, even with you. Now, look, I have done some prep. I've reread your book, but basically, I make this up as I go along. So it's going to be a bit of a magical mystery tour, depending on our our conversation. I'm conscious we've got high power, but I always start with the same question. Did you always want to be an investor? And I'm delighted to answer the question, Steve. Thank you for having me here. Please don't be stressed. Yes, William does prepare a lot. I prepare when I have to interview somebody a lot less. And so let's all relax and have fun. And did I always want to be an investor? The answer is no. I didn't really know what investing was. Uh, the first time I came across investing was my father driving me to or from school in Iran, where he had figured out uh, that he could buy stocks and shares. And he was sending orders in to the banker that, where he'd opened a bank account in Switzerland. And he would ask me to look up the price. I remember we'd get something like the International Herald Tribune. And I'd look up the price of, for example, IBM, and he'd get all excited if it had gone up and he'd get all unhappy if it had gone down. And I didn't really think about investing until I would say for me, age 
26, 27. Oh, really? That's quite late. And what had happened to me is that I was absolutely infected with this idea of efficient markets. So why would anybody become an investor? Because if the markets are efficient, there's no real input there. And so up to then, I didn't really think about it as something for me to do. Investors were just people who were out there who were providing capital for reinvestment. The only thing that I did cotton on to early on was that around the same time that my father was um, asking me about shares, and I remember he specifically asked me about IBM, but there were probably others as well, he got an HP 12C calculator. And I used to love sitting and playing with financial functions. And, uh, you know, I'd love to recreate, uh, in, I'd love to have a camera on me, to, because I remember sort of looking at different percentage rates of return and knowing that my father had money to invest and asking myself what would happen if you had this percentage rate of return for X amount of years and pressing the FV future value button and discovering that was when I discovered the miracle of compound interest. I mean, it just blew me away when I thought about how my father's money could grow. But then I didn't think about it for another decade and a half. I mean, I would have been like 10 years old. Oh, when that funny. Happened. And you grew up in Iran. It's a complicated story. We came to Iran as a family in 1970 when my father took a job with a multinational chemicals company. And so I did part of my growing up in Iran from 1970 to 77 before we moved as a family to the UK. All right. so, and what, um, was, what was Iran like? It was amazing. It really was. It, was a, it is a beautiful place. Uh, I have such positive memories of Iran. I learned to ski there. Uh, there are colors in Iran that I can't wait to see again. There's a kind of a blue that you get in blue uh, glass. I guess there's a lapis lazuli is, the, is what they call it. But um, pomegranates in autumn, I, just, just an amazing place, amazing people. And I've not been able to go back since the revolution and would not go back because we were heavily associated with the Israeli embassy and so until there's a new government in Iran, I would not even think about going there. But the minute there is, I'll go there in a heartbeat. Yeah, no, it's a place I've always fancied going to. And um, there have been a few frontier investors who have <laughs> gone out, bought some very cheap stocks, only to find that they've got quite a lot cheaper. But I was interested that you believed in the efficient market hypothesis. And you had this like amazing economics tutor, Peter Sinclair, who's yeah. regarded like one of the top academics. I mean, he's taught people like Tim Harford, Diane Coyle, Camilla Cavendish. And he also taught David Cameron, yes. who was one of your contemporaries. So look, did he just indoctrinate you that you that you believed this? I, first of all, Peter Sinclair is, um, you know, they say that uh, your teachers become like your parents. And he became like a parent to me. He changed my life. I was an unhappy law student, and he made it possible for me to switch subjects. So it was a, uh, and, and so he, he really is like a father figure to me, became a friend, and uh, it's very tragic that he passed away early in COVID. Mm. He was quite overweight. And I reconnected with all of those people, actually, through the memorial service that was held for him. Uh, and... Um, I wouldn't say that Peter, no, Peter was not an indoctrinating type at all. He was just very excited to see somebody who's enthusiastic about his subject. And he was a classical academic economist and got excited about great ideas. And uh, the um, efficient market hypothesis and something that was very prevalent at the time, rational expectations, which is an assumption that economists made to make their models work, just made it, made, it, made it so elegant. And so you would get excited about the elegance of the idea. And I think that I just have a mind that um, loves those things. I mean, I think perhaps we all do. We love elegant ideas. And sometimes elegant ideas do explain the world. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes the world is very, very messy. But and, the investing world usually is quite messy, right? And, uh, you know, and it's interesting. So, so years later... I, I've kind of discovered um, what some people call chaos theory or um, th this idea that uh, systems in biology, for example, are far better explanators of the economy. And I came to Peter and I said, you know, this, this, there's a better word than chaos theory for it because it doesn't, it doesn't capture all of it. It's complex adaptive systems is, is a better word for it. And, and this guy, Michael Malberson, whom you should interview, 
is at the Santa Fe Institute where there's a lot of research done into this. And I come to Peter and I say, you know, Peter, all of these biological systems and complex adaptive systems are a much better way of modeling human behavior, don't you think? He said, yeah. And he said, the problem is, is that you either have to do text descriptions or the mathematics is just too complex and complicated to make any predictions. And so, uh, you know, and, and in a sense, I've started reading economics again, in, a se in part out of, to kind of honor Peter Sinclair and to honor a career path that I didn't take. Economists get excited about taking the complex world and turning it into a simple model. And often those models are super useful, but sometimes we get carried away. And the efficient market hypothesis was certainly a place in which many of us got carried away. And, I yeah. And what was it like? So you, you were a contemporary of David Cameron, our former prime minister at, at, at Oxford. And you were a contemporary of Chris Horn and Bill Ackman at Harvard, two highly successful yeah. hedge fund managers, both billionaires. I mean, you're a pretty successful guy. You're pretty wealthy. But I was just wondering, is it difficult to be satisfied when you compare yourself with billionaires and prime ministers? Or, and... Did studying with these guys, did that raise your game at university? And does having peers like them make you continue to raise your game? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. So, um, you know, you you become like the people you hang out with. And so those are some of the people that I hung out with early in my life. Just to give you a little more color, thanks to Peter Sinclair, I participate. He, he um, from time to time, would put three or four or five students together. So normally a tutorial was two students, one of them reading out an essay and one of them handing it in. And uh, he, he put sort of four or five students together. So I shared, I don't know how many sessions with David Cameron. And this was in probably what was my third year at Oxford, but my first year studying economics. And uh, it would have been in his second year studying economics. And I mean, I, I was at the time floored, floored, as in on the floor, by his capacity for self-expression, elegant self-expression, his understanding of the underlying concepts and the confidence, but also the humility with which he expressed them. I mean, I was, it was kind of, I, I came to Oxford uh, ill prepared for what it was and was, was kind of racing to catch up for pretty much all of the four years <laughs> that I was there. Because, but so that, that's David. And then I really had zero contact with him. I mean, I, our paths did not cross in any way, shape, or form. Um, in the case of Bill and Chris, Chris, I did spend quite a bit of time with him at uh, Harvard Business School and quite a bit of time with him in the year two or three afterwards. But he moved to London. He was in New York and Boston for a while, but then he moved to London. He regularly asked me if I was coming back, and I, and I kind of wanted to stay in New York. And so I, I did not see him as much, and I would say that I see him now maybe for a coffee in his office uh, once every year or two. <laughs> and um, But he's always very kind and, and gives me the time of day in his office. I did not, I mean, he was always as intense as I think the people who experience him today. Uh, he, couldn't, um, he couldn't have been that intense when he was young, surely. He was extremely intense and yeah. unbelievably focused. And um, uh, so so I didn't, I don't think at the time that I quite understood the intensity and the focus. And uh, And then Bill Ackman, I mean, so I can't say that I'm directly friends with Bill Ackman, but we share a friend in this uh, Whitney Tilson who sees him a lot. And, I, and he's, my experience with Bill, the times that I've been in the same room as him and the stories that I've heard from people one step removed is that he's an extraordinarily generous guy. I don't think people quite realize how extraordinarily generous he is. I mean, I know people who've shown up in his office to just try and talk to him about some charitable organization, they walk out with a substantial check. Uh, I don't know if he still does that, so please don't go and quote that to Bill and expect him to write you a check. Uh, also, listeners, don't go to Bill's <laughs> office in Columbus Circle but, and disturb him. But he's an extraordinarily generous guy, and he's been extraordinarily generous with me. Actually, when I started getting interested in investing, I came to his office in, uh, it, was in it was close to or perhaps in the Bear Stearns building, 237 Park Avenue, and he just said, oh, just come use the Bloomberg outside. You can't come into the inner sanctuary, but feel free to. And that was like wonderful for me. I was so extraordinarily grateful for it. And so those are my interactions. It's not, a, it's not any kind of deep friendship with any of them. Uh, not even. It's kind of like they know who I am, but not a lot more. 
Um, and I would say that, yeah, I think that especially living in New York, uh, it's not that I asked myself to ask the question, but the question just arose in my mind. And, um, uh, and, and especially to the extent that I was friends with Chris and spent a lot of time with him. So there's inevitably, there's the question arises, or it even arose when at a time when I was um, it's sort of like doing fundraising rounds or going on beauty contests in places like Geneva. And the bankers would say, uh, first of all, they'd, they'd doubt that I had known Chris Hahn at all. And then they'd say, well, why aren't you doing what he's doing? Or why aren't, don't you, aren't your returns the way his returns are? And um, I think that I struggled with it for a while until, and I struggled it as well with Warren Buffett. I mean, I literally, when I came across Warren Buffett, I had the arrogance to think that maybe I was smart as Warren Buffett. I was capable of putting out the same returns as Warren Buffett. Like, I think, a bunch of other people. I'm not alone in that. And it was hard for me to realize that I was not. And I guess the only appropriate place to go is to realize that you're on your own path. And there, there are many, many things that come together to generate outlying success. Uh, and you should be happy with the success that you can generate. We will never, ever know what combination of things came together in, say, Chris and Bill to develop the results. They may not know themselves. And there's certainly skill and hard work plays a part. Luck also plays a part, and they come together in an unusual way. And there's a kind of like a, an, an increase in wisdom that, com that comes from realizing that it's actually not important to be the most outlying outlier. And it's funny because I have conversations with my children who you know, obviously, like any human, want to say that they own their intelligence. This is mine, you know? And I kind of say, well, no, actually, it's not yours. You happen to inherit the genes that you inherited because you won an ov ovarian lottery, or you maybe didn't win it. You got your particular ticket in the ov ovarian lottery, and you were born with a particular set of genes in a particular family in particular circumstances. And all that has come together, together to make you you. And so we should have a little more humility for people who, or you should have a little more humility around people who may be not as smart, not as motivated, not as a whole bunch of things. So um, I think that that's an important step on the path to wisdom. But you're absolutely right, though, that it was bugging me enough that it helped me to take the decision to leave New York. And it's far easier to say those things not living in New York than it is living in New York. That's interesting. So when you decided to leave New York, and you you moved to Zurich then? Yes, that's correct. So how did that conversation go with the wife? Well, darling, so I, uh, we're, going to, <laughs> we're going to Zurich. I, mean, I, I have um, an amazing wife. And, and you know, I need to tell her that I love her in front of as many people as possible. So I hope you don't mind, Stephen Laurie. I love you very, very much. I'm so lucky to be married to you. That's one but... more listener. Great. <laughs> and, and all of her friends in Mexico and all the... But she grew up in Mexico. But... Um, Laurie's an adventuresome type. I mean, she came to New York age 21. I met her on the second day that she was in New York. And she was up for the adventure. And How did you meet? Laurie and I met through mutual friends. I like to say we met at a bar, but that's not entirely accurate. We met through mutual friends, but friends of mine that she'd met the day before, actually, in New York. And it was her birthday when we... And, and, and this guy said, well, it's your birthday. I'll take you for dinner and I'll call up a friend and see if he's free. And I actually brought a date with me. <laughs> Oh, funny. <laughs> so, um, but no, she, she well, I, you know, and I was, I was talking to her about the desire to move. And we, it was also driven in part because the situation with children and schools in New York City is complicated. And yeah. we didn't understand how yeah. to play the game. And I think that if we had not left, if we had not moved to Zurich, and if we'd have stayed in New York City, for example, we might have moved to a place like Park Slope or just a more Westchester County or a place that was more reasonable to yeah. have children. So, but she was totally up for it. And uh, she's an adventuresome type. And I feel very grateful and lucky for that. We've been on many adventures as a family together. But um, yeah, that's, a, that's quite cool. I mean, that, 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 I could have that conversation. But anyway, let's go, just go back to your career because I was interested, you know, reading yeah. your book, you, you, your first job was at William Blair, an institution which you clearly didn't like and an uh, experience you clearly didn't enjoy. And you left there without having another job, right? Do you want to just very briefly just yeah. tell us about the circumstances? Because I think there's quite a lot of lessons to learn from it's, that. Yeah, it's So many. And just to be clear, William Blair is a highly reputable 
um, uh, smaller brokerage firm that may still be around. And we must make sure that um, so all the folks at William Blair, you guys are great. <laughs> there's there's so, so let's just be clear. We're talking about a firm that is, I don't think, anymore in existing in existence. And it's called D.H. Blair. Uh, this and, and there's no problem with you doing that because, Stephen, that is a very, very important point. What these bucket shops do is that they want to play off the perception that there's something else. So they would name themselves, they would take the name of a well-known firm and, you know, instead of calling themselves Goldman's Axe, they'd call themselves Geldman's Ox. Believe it or oh. not, that there would be people who'd be duped by that. And it's just kind of insane. And in a certain way, you made the exact mistake that the people at D.H. Blair wanted you to make. Well, you know what I did was when I was writing up my notes, I actually, I, I've got a friend at William Blair. Right. And we were, we were meant to be meeting up for a drink. And obviously that was in my mind yeah. as I was as I was writing the notes. So Isn't my that profuse scary? apologies to William Blair. Yeah. But might, that, might even become clients. So, but you it, know. it makes a really, really important point. Yeah that uh, a friend and my and I have played around with. So the mind creates positive associations. It's not very good at creating negative associations. So uh, we, we kind of like toyed with the idea of um, writing on uh, one of our Wikipedia pages, you know, um, Guy Spear has never worked for George Soros. And it doesn't matter that there's a negative there because in the human mind, most human minds will make a positive association there. So, so D.H. Blair, um, uh, is a sort of like, I wouldn't say carbon copy, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, if anybody here has watched the movie, I'm sure most people have, is a sort of an exaggeration of what happened at D.H. Blair. And extraordinary misjudgment on my part and lack of judgment at age 27. So you'd think that I was, you know, that's getting a little late in the game to start to be making really big career mistakes. And I would call that a really big career mistake. And if you want to, we I've thought long and hard about what were the circumstances that came together to make such a big career mistake. But yes, I went to work at a Wolf of Wall Street type place in which the people at the firm, many of them did not have university degrees, a small number who did. It was run by a guy who was uh, actually a Harvard Business School graduate uh, who owned the firm, extremely smart and aggressive in his interpretation of the rules. And um, they were very, the whole firm was of the mindset that the marketplace and the participants in the marketplace are a resource to be exploited by playing fast and loose with the rules and being highly aggressive and burning relationships. And what's amazing is, is that um, that is a strategy for life. It, it, it works, actually. And there were people who made significant amounts of money there. I think it doesn't allow you to become Warren Buffett wealthy, but it allows people who might have had jobs running a car mechanic workshop or maybe even drug dealers or whatever it was that they were doing with maybe just a high school certificate to make far more money than they could have ever expected to make, just like the people at Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. And um, I was fascinated by finance. And I loved, I, one of the reasons why I made the mistake is the guy gave me the title of vice president and he said, you'll be doing deals from day one. And that kind of appealed to me. And I can remember telling friends of mine that I was going to be vice president in an investment bank. And that, you know, in this sort of outer scorecard world of Harvard Business School at the time, there were some who were kind of struck with envy with that, you know. And instead of investing in myself and investing in relationships with people that could, could, I could build for the long term, I was going for this stupid external scorecard stuff. But the lessons, as you say, are, are profound and deep because I think that I saw in microcosm and in extreme ways something, patterns that repeat themselves time and again all over Wall Street. And so uh, I have these debates with my father about whether it was a good idea to go there, and he thinks it was. I still think it was a terrible idea. There were other ways to learn those lessons. And the worst part is, is that I really did have a, a reputational hole to fill. And I think that you know, the younger you are when you make reputational mistakes, the better you, you people will give you the benefit of the doubt. But the older you are when you make them, the more time it's going to take for people to really kind of like start trusting mm. you. Why did and, your dad say that it was a good idea that, for you to go? I mean, just a lesson, but, but, lesson? You know, learned, com coming, when I saw, I mean, just to give examples of what was standard practice, you'd take these companies public with no earnings and just a 
projection and a, obviously a highly charismatic salesperson. That's, that works well. <laughs> as a CEO. And you would wrap these kind of like uh, uh, options into the security that allowed it to be unraveled at some point. And you would have a bid-ask spread of, you know, you take the company public at five, but the bid was at four. And, you know, unsuspecting retail investors didn't think much of that, but you're actually taking a bid-ask spread of 20%, which is just enormous, not mm. to mention the fact that the company took an underwriting fee and it also took options. And so you they were taking money every which way. And... Um, uh, so, so, but, but that allowed me to, to see what was going on, for example, in my father's bank account with his Swiss bank, where kind of I started asking about the fees, and the, and they said, well, um, uh, well, actually they're very low. I remember this banker saying because we just charge a custodial fee, and I remember looking at the the brokerage statement, and and I was telling my father they are you're receiving a bond coupon, and they've charged you a processing fee for the bond coupon. Where on earth does a bond coupon require a processing fee? And uh, my father came and asked the question. He actually brought me to one of the meetings, and they kind of hummed and hawed. So I, I had now, and my father had this approach to a banker that they're a bit like a doctor, you know. And you really do trust a doctor to give um, a professional opinion. And he felt like it should be the same at a bank. And I started telling my father stories <laughs> about how I worked at a bank, and these people were all. You know, I mean, there was a famous expression. You probably know this. Some people who've worked, quote, on Wall Street as a rip. They, you would have brokers on the 14th, 15th floor who would boast about ripping the client's face off. You know, <laughs> wow. So, um, so it was. It was in a way. It was also a learning curve. I mean, we were immigrants. My father had grown up in Israel. My mother on a on a kibbutz, on a, not a kibbutz, on a moshav, but in a sort of like socialist environment. My mother had grown up in South Africa. And so I think that we as a family were going up a learning curve and becoming more deeply understanding of sophisticated things like financial markets. And he was going up a learning curve. So, um, so yeah, I, so he feels like because of my experience at D.H. Blair, um, he went up that learning curve. I think he would have gone up that learning curve if I'd gone to work at Goldman Sachs, which probably if I'd continued with the interviews would have been an option for me. But... I was just too desperate to get off the train tracks. You know, that was another part of me. Well, I, Go Goldman Sachs are also good at extracting money from their from their from their but, clients. But, but I but apologize again to William Blair, which uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually a big fan of. That was D. H. Blair. But your your dad gave you a million dollars to invest, and and later with two associates gave you fifteen million dollars. Yeah. Uh, why did he trust you with so much money, or was it not a meaningful? No, that was, very, that, was, that was very meaningful. That was everything. So what, was, why did he do that? Um, I ask myself the question to this day. You know, he's around. You could ask him. He might, he might give you an answer. Or we might, um, do a po we might do a postscript. We'll do a Zoom call with your dad. That'd I mean, you cool. know, I, I've just been lucky enough to spend time with him over the last couple of days. And um, he's a very different personality to me uh, in that. So I am I am good with numbers relatively but i'm not that good on the eq side at least not compared to him and he on the other on on the other hand is just amazing with relationships but uh and uh, you know I, maybe not as good at numbers as i am uh something like that but he also had some pretty amazing amazing he was a farm boy wasn't up to much, but somehow the Israeli military saw leadership qualities in him and took him and put him through an officer's course and put him into various leadership positions in the Israeli army for the time that he was there. And um, I think that, uh, at least in his case, leadership is taking bold decisions. It's also, and I, I've learned this, you know, you, you just, you either trust somebody or you don't. And if you do trust them, plunge in with both feet and it's kind of scary but he's capable of doing that and i think that he's faced uh he, he's faced very dangerous situations where his life was at risk multiple times and he's seen friends die in various wars and so i think that you have a very different approach to decision making and in a certain way risk taking once you've seen that investing all of your liquid liquid net with your son is a no-brainer and just easy i suppose but it scared the hell out of me scared the living daylights out of me because 
I knew that there wasn't anything else around. If I got that wrong, he would be relying on his business for um, taking care of him in retirement. So, And I think that it made me more risk-averse than I would have been otherwise, but perhaps I would have been very risk-averse anyway. You, you write in your book that given your family's history of loss in Nazi Germany, that you're nervous about losing money, you don't like debt, and you explain that's one reason for having Berkshire in a portfolio that's balanced financially and emotionally. But you, you also write that investors need to understand their relationship with money. And with that understanding, you could make adjustments. I thought that was a very astute observation and something I hadn't previously thought about. I was wondering how you got to that conclusion. You obviously think about a great deal about how to be a better investor, how to be a better person. You, how, do you, how do you arrive at these conclusions? I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> you know, what I'm, what I'm realizing is that we're, we're, so we're both, I'm realizing now, Steve, out of the box thinkers. And that, that's kind of like a hackneyed phrase, but some people's minds don't go in straight lines. <laughs> And, and I think that uh, those of us who have minds that don't go in straight lines don't understand why they don't go in straight lines. They just do. They make jumps in ways that other minds don't make. And we don't even realize that those, those jumps are unusual. But I think, that, I think that my point that you're getting at, and it, it's, I guess it, maybe it should be blindingly obvious, is that every single individual's perspective is different. And... Um, well, I, I, and even before that, so, so a point that I've made many times and, and people always sort of like are surprised by it when I make it, when you read a story in the financial press that um, looks at the moves of one investor or another, most of the time those stories don't show the move in the context of the whole portfolio. The person where I think it's potentially the most uh, uh, damaging or misleading is this guy, Carl Icahn, who I think has made a... Um, exquisite art form, if you like, of revealing some of what he's doing to the market for his purposes. But the reality is far more complex. So I, I, I remember reading somewhere that one of the things that he would do is he would, he would establish a position that was neutral using options in a company and then just do stuff to increase the volatility. He didn't know if it was going to go up or down, but it didn't matter so long as the volatility increased. And it, it appeared to people that he was either long or short, but he'd neutralized that out through options and he was just pushing volatility, but th that was not the agenda that he appeared to have. So not everything is what it seems to be, if you like. I've oh, just, sure. yeah. Yeah, I've been reading a book um, that uh, is going to be coming out shortly by a guy called Chris Chabris called Nobody's Fool. And he's the famous man behind the experiment of the gorillas where you count the basketball players and you see the gorillas and nobody sees the gorillas the first time around, things aren't what you see, our, our minds play tricks with us. So, um, so that perspective of you cannot really evaluate a move that somebody's made if you don't see their whole portfolio because otherwise you're, you're just not seeing the, the whole agenda and the whole picture. And in the same way, I, I know clearly, I mean, I think that in part, just to try and answer your question a little bit better is that at the time that I'm writing that book, I've already been spending an enormous amount of time with Monish Pabrai, and I'm seeing that he has an extraordinarily different approach to money than I do. And um, and this com comes through even things that we've been discussing recently. I mean, it's well known that he loves Turkey and I don't, for example. And um, for him, um, I, he, I don't enjoy going to a casino and sort of like, placing bets and even with games like blackjack I don't, and blackjack the odds are pretty good i mean you can there you can argue that in certain casino tables if you count and what have you you can do almost as well as the house um he he doesn't mind that he doesn't mind seeing seeing the pile of chips go down for half the evening because he's using a strategy that will eventually get them back and i just don't like that so he clearly has a different approach to money than i do and i started asking myself why and i think that you can tie that to experiences that people have had in their childhood so and so i think that that's extremely important to understand in ourselves rather than me sitting there and i guess it also came from this i'm sitting there going why am i not able to take the same decisions that monish pabra is able to take why am i not able to develop the same degree of comfort and when you ask your quest the question enough and he, he laughs. He says, yeah, I'm going to tell Guy Spear this idea and, and he's going to go into his bomb shelter. He calls it the bomb shelter. He called me up and he'll say, have you come out of the bomb shelter yet? And um, 
So asking that question, I started realizing that it's got to do with our very different childhood experiences. And, and possibly even before that, a very different approach to what life is and what the world is about. I think that if you, if you grow up in a Jewish environment or a Judeo-Christian environment even, um, there is history, there is tragedy. Uh, things unfold for the better or for the worse. But if you grow up in a, as I understand it, and I'm not claiming any um, uh, expertise here, there's, there's the idea in the Hindu world of reincarnation of souls, and, and there's a circular life. To, history doesn't unfold towards some destination. Life just repeats itself. And maybe in a world where life just repeats itself endlessly, you have a different approach to money because it kind of comes and goes, whereas that's not the feeling. There's tragedy, there's loss, and then there's rebuilding. You try and hold on to it, something like that. But And it seems to me that if we understand all of the stuff behind all of those kind of psychological underpinnings and just the perspective of consolidating the person's balance sheet, um, we do better. Yeah. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if so, you're bound to enjoy our free newsletter on Substack. It's a weekly email I send out each Sunday morning on interesting investing related topics. Just visit behindthebalancesheet.com and hit that little sign up button on the top right. And while you're there, you should check out our fabulous online investor training school. Hundreds of students have taken our flagship Analyst Academy course, which teaches you everything you need to become a serious equity investor. And if you're a professional investor, we also run a forensic accounting course for institutional clients and a cohort based course for smaller funds and for serious amateurs. Email me at info at behind the balance sheet .com for more information. So you're most famous for Monish for having lunch with Warren Buffett. Yeah. And you underwrote a third of the cost of that lunch, yeah. $250,000. Now, it was a little while ago when $250,000 yeah. was worth more than it is today. You're a wealthy guy and were even then, but it's like an expensive lunch. What did you hope to get out of it? And obviously, it's been worth much more than $250,000 to you. But um, what's the moral of that, of that, what what should we take away? What should we learn from that? You know, um, so so I mean, uh, a, a phrase that has just stayed with me so often, which is slightly unrelated, but maybe I'll find a way to make it related, is if you want an adventure, tell the truth. Uh, and and I think that in this case, it's not so. So in this case, if you want, if you want your life to be an adventure, if you want to live an interesting life pick up those low cost lottery tickets, you know, and, and actually even that you could argue that that was not a low cost lottery ticket. It was a pretty expensive lottery no, ticket. Pretty expensive. But, yeah. but you know, when, if you can afford it, and I remember on, on an Israeli interviewer asking me, so, you know, how do you decide to invest in a lunch? And I said, look, you probably don't want to do it if it's more than 5% of your net worth or you're know, probably even less, but pick up those lottery tickets because you live a more interesting life. And actually, if I stop and think about it with you right now, so there was a huge element of that was just saying, I mean, there are people who spend more money on a motor car. And you know, what's the motor car going to get you? It's going to get you a few nice drives. It's going to get you a little bit of envy. It's going to get you some nice experience. I'm not saying it's a terrible thing, but the range of outcomes and the possibilities that unfold for your life when you go and have lunch with Warren Buffett are way beyond. I mean, so, so you have a huge... Okay, so, so from the car enthusiast's perspective, you're not going to get all those wonderful drives in that car. So you, they, they could say that the, 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 um, you know, the downside is less protected because it really gets one stupid lunch, you know, and how long could the lunch last? But the upside is far more likely to be infinite in, in, the, in, the, in the lunch case. So um, why not pick up that lottery ticket if you can afford it? And actually, why not pick up a lot more lottery tickets? I mean, I think there's some... There's a book or a movie or something, the year of saying yes. It's my year of saying yes. In a certain way, that's saying pick up the lottery tickets. There's so many lottery tickets that are offered to us, and we just have to be smart about them. So, you know, I don't think that the thrill of jumping off a cliff in a wingsuit is worth the downside, which is a great big fat zero. And I think that many of us probably, even in the financial markets, pick up those kinds of lottery tickets. But if you can see that the downside is totally affordable and limited, why not get more of those things that are unlimited upside? So I think that's an enormous lesson. And to put that into more specific terms, 
if I know that somebody's interesting or I've met somebody who's interesting or where I kind of get the feeling that there's potential there for something, it's okay to um, travel across the planet to see them, even just for dinner. And I actually did that. I, I went, I, based on that reasoning, I went, I flew basically to California from Zurich to celebrate a friend's birthday because I knew it would be a special event. And that is not a dumb thing to do. Uh, just, I mean, and because you're putting yourself in the presence of potentiality, which creates all sorts of other things. And so I think that's just an enormous, enormous lesson for me. And what's also very interesting is that Monish saw that and I didn't. He needed to spell it out for me. And, and, and when he spelled it out for me, I saw it. And I think that there was an element of me that wanted to, wanted to have the adventure if there was an adventure. And in a certain way, I got the adventure, doing that would get me the adventure with Monish anyway. And so, and I've, I've said this, that the, the, just meeting Warren Buffett and the things that happened subsequently was certainly transformative for me. But that whole experience would have been transformative for me if none of the things around Warren Buffett would have happened and just the things around Monish would have happened. And um, in, in the case with Monish, it's not just that I uh, met all sorts of interesting people. It's that I completely reconfigured my business based on what the conversations that I was having with him. And the biggest change for me in moving to Zurich was that I could make a clean break with what I'd been doing in the past, which was some kind of New York hedge fund model and do a very, very different model for, for running my business. So I feel like uh, between, uh, you know, my father certainly taught me an enormous amount, but Monish has taught me an equally enormous amount about how to run a business in a way that's fun and interesting and makes sense. Uh, and then, you know, with Warren Buffett, I mean, there were, I think that, you know, and I can dive in as much as you like, Steve, but one of the, and, and so, so somebody says, well, you can go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting and, and be in the same room as him. And that's absolutely right. <laughs> well, you with barely the, see him yeah, that with, far away. <laughs> with, with all, all 50,000 of mine and Warren's closest friends, it's still a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. But I think that being in the room with Warren for those three and something hours, help me to grow in ways that I didn't want to grow, you know? And, and I think that uh, I've been seeing this in all sorts of relationships where we want to grow without the pain, but actually growth, spiritual growth, most of the time happens when there's, when there's pain involved. And I actually think that a healthy marital relationship and also healthy relationship with our children involves friction and pain. It's, it's not supposed to be harmonious. If it's harmonious the whole time, we're not actually growing as individuals. And so the pain for me being around Warren was first of all, was, was just, to, you know, I don't think that my mind will ever have, have as high a clock speed as Warren's does. And I think there is an element that when you're with somebody who's far younger and far less experienced than you are, then you can appear to have a higher clock speed to that person. You can appear to be more intelligent than you really are because there's this sort of difference of perspective. And I like to tell, younger people all the time, you think I'm smart, it's not, it's just that you don't have the experience that I do. But I think that I can correct for that. And, and, and even if you take that into account, he has a mind that has an extraordinarily high clock speed, a really exhilarating to be around. And, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd leap at the opportunity to spend more time around it, you know, one on one, but you know, it's not not happening. Um, uh, or maybe it does, who knows what happens, you know, I'm hankering after I, I did a project where we hypothetically looked at what it would take to get IKEA to sell itself to Berkshire Hathaway. And my sole goal was I knew that if, um, if I know that if ever I had a hand in helping a deal like that to happen, Warren would take me for lunch one more time with happily, I'm sure he would. But so, so just out of the interest of getting the lunch. But so being in the presence, and I think that what's really hard is, and I, and I, I guess, you know, I should, I should remember, Steve, that we're talking to an audience. Um, you know, it's I, I, as I've kind of progressed to where I am right now, never, if I could tell a couple of things to my, uh, to the person I was 20 years younger is that I'd say, Guy, you have no understanding of how limited uh, some of the people, how limited the time is of some of the people that you adulate. And if you want to get into their lives, you really have to learn how to respect their time. And there are all sorts of techniques for doing that. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to make a second point about talking to my 20-year-old self, but um, 
yeah, it's this, that if, if you're an ambitious person and, um, you know, don't think that these highly successful people are versions of your friends who won the lottery ticket. They have, they may have, there may be a lottery ticket aspect to it. They may have won the ovarian lottery. They may have come across, but there are also personalities that have learned to project themselves in the world a certain way and use the world in a certain way. And whatever they've got is actually very, very rare. And so investing the resources to be in the same room as them, because you can learn from that, simply being in the room with them makes an enormous amount of sense. And so, uh, you know, if it, take the time and, and yes, 50, being in, in, with Warren and me and 50,000 of our friends is not the same as being just in the room with Warren, but it's still worthwhile doing that. It's still worthwhile if, if, if that person resonates flying 12 hours just to celebrate a birthday with them or just to go and have a lunch. I actually, in a couple of weeks' time, will go to India with Monish for a couple of days. And really, it's just to spend one day in the presence of a few people who have an extraordinary business. And so, yeah, I've learned from that and it reinforced that in me, if you like. So, so any other... you been to California, going to India, anything else that you that you've splashed out on? That... That, uh, so investing large resources into um, being in the presence of somebody, I really don't think I've done it enough, actually, and nothing comes to mind right now. I think that what what in a more general sense, we can we can allocate, we can put all of that into the bucket of investing in one's psychological, intellectual, and social capital. And actually, it's funny because in London, there's a kind of a slightly different perspective on it. I think that there are a lot of people in, in London or in the UK, especially some of the people that uh, I, either, I either am from, friends with or was friends with, who are doing it in a kind of the British social structure class system. I don't want to necessarily dive into that rabbit hole, but, but there's a certain element of that which is kind of pointless. And I'm, and and I think that it's hard to distinguish. If it's harder for me in London to distinguish between the two, uh, but and I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about. I I you know recently there was the coronation of now King Charles. So I've joked with people and said, Steve, I didn't see you at the coronation. Where were you? You know, it's really fun to say that in London because there are at least some of the people who they do a double take because they get the first reaction is, no, the guy wasn't there. He's just messing with me. They go. Was he there and I wasn't? <laughs> but they know you were at Berkshire Hathaway meeting. Uh, they should know, but they don't even... They, they wouldn't... Many of these people wouldn't know what the Berkshire Hathaway meeting was. But I would give you an example recently. Um, and I can't remember... I mean, I can't remember exactly in what context it was, but uh, 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 somebody that you're probably aware of, Nick Sleep, invited me to join him at Goodwood. He loves uh, racing cars. So... You know, I made the special effort, flew back to London a couple of days before my Nick, son's. Nick, I'm available. <laughs> it doesn't seem like Nick does podcasts. I, I would tell you that um, uh, it's Nick and Case. Case is is a genius mathematician. He's, as best I can tell, a supporter of the London Mathematical Institute. There's a guy called Ole Peters at the London Mathematical Institute who's very worth... I have not met him in person, but... Um, yeah, so I went and spent time there. And here's something that's also interesting is that, I mean, I explained to my children the reason why you go to a wedding is because you just want to be at the event. So you can build your relationship with people at the wedding even if you don't talk to them. And so, you know, what I did at Goodwood is that I said hello to Nick's wife for like two minutes and we all watched him racing around the track, which was kind of pretty fun, but it wasn't more than that. But I know that next time I'm with Nick, that experience will kind of inform. And actually, funnily enough, if I stop and think about it, we we share an interest in cycling. And so um, he talked to me about this thing, Tour de Force, where you cycle on the route of the um, Tour de France, uh, either a few weeks before or after. I don't remember exactly when. Very tough cycling for me. I couldn't even finish one of the full days that the Tour de France cyclists do. So I was taking a bus. But Nick couldn't be there that year for some reason or another. But it's okay because we kind of share the experience that we both around the same people and did the same kinds of things. So there are all sorts of ways to do it. And it, it's something that, um, you know, uh, get yourself into the environment 
that 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 activates all those things for you and often that's just being around the right people and you you said that the the buffett lunch helped you to grow in ways you didn't want to i mean what what sort of things i mean yeah i mean no that very very and how did he do that how did he exert that influence i still could not put to bed the idea that maybe if i just focused on the right things did the right work uh you know was actually as good as warren buffett (laughs) And so, you know, the, I, but the, the experience of being at lunch with him forced me to grow in that way, forced me to accept that that wasn't the case, forced me to put that to bed. Didn't allow me, I would have, you know, I would have had to be in total denial and drinking Kool-Aid to be walking around afterwards thinking that I could be some version of Warren Buffett. And of course, there's pain associated with that. Uh, but once I'd put that pain to bed and accepted it, it freed me up to focus on what I really could do, which is to live Guy Spears' best possible life. And, um, and you know, I think that when you have a hero, that's really, really hard. I think it's also probably, I'm, I'm the father of teenage children, you know, the, 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 the feeling that you can't have your child live the best possible life that you would like for them to lead. You have to let them become the best possible person that they want to be. And that's still a lesson that I'm learning with the help of all sorts of people, but uh... yes, uh, I, my children don't listen to the podcast, so I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't need to worry about that. Now, you 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 work on your own now without yeah. an analyst. Yeah, you, you you said in the book your assistant sold his personal holdings in two thousand and eight. Yeah, was that the right decision? And how do you find the time? Because you do a lot of stuff. Like yeah. you've got Value X, you've got yeah. your own podcast. Yeah. I mean, how do you? fit it all in and and why is it better to be in your own having somebody else to bounce ideas off of course you've got monish yeah I suppose, but. well the thing is is you know it doesn't help if all monish wants to talk about is turkey and i've kind of written turkey off for one reason or another so then so so in that case certainly one needs more than i mean more than one relationship to talk to people to, to talk to about and and monish has plenty of relationships in addition to me and i think that's um, a good thing. Um, so I would say that getting into doing this 25 years ago, I, I remember I was single and people would meet me and they'd, they'd go, oh, wow. So now I'd been upgraded from vice president at Sleazy Investment Bank to um, you know, CEO, I guess you'd call it, managing partner. And and at the time, you know, in early early 30s, late 20s in age, people were impressed with that. And then I kind of continued to say, well, I'm also the mail boy, you know, the phone answerer, chief assistant, chief analyst, you know, investor relations, whole bunch of things. And so, so, I mean, I was asked this question. At that time, I think that I was spending well more than 50% of my time administering all sorts of things in the business because I was a kind of a one one man shop. So I think that I have more more capacity to do other things because I have a team around me, an administrative administrative team around me that helps me with those things. And to some degree, the other things that I do reflect things that I'm willing to do, but things that the team are interested in. So the team, then we had a Value X event at Berkshire. They loved it. They loved organizing it. And I kind of said to them, look, I'd love if you come to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting because I think you'll learn a lot. It's good training. And they'd much prefer to be involved in organizing a, a sort of an event like that than just being at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. So to some degree, it's kind of allowing the team to do the things that they're interested in. And they enjoy doing that and they enjoy... But then, but it's true that it takes up a certain amount of my time. I think that when you have the investing style that I do, I mean, Warren Buffett said from time to time that he would have done better to have just snuck into the cinema and watched movies. And so the action that he took was probably counterproductive. And I think that based on the time that it took for me to administer my little business 25 years ago, I developed an investing style in which inaction is almost invariably the right thing to do. And what I focused on uh, because of that inaction in terms of the business is to keep driving down the costs of investing with me. So that helps. I also, I mean, I think it's lovely to have people to bounce ideas off. And I kind of, I think that if you have a, a partnership like Nick and Case, it's really, really lovely. And that seems to have worked really, really well for them. But I got, I had the experience of, um, I don't want to talk to this person anymore. 
because for one reason or another, I'm just not interested in what they have to say for me to me right now. But now they're an employee. You know, I can't just like say, you know, get rid of them because I don't want to talk to them anymore. And so the experience around the analyst that I had in New York, he's a lovely, lovely guy and he's a friend and he was an investor in the fund for the longest time. Um, I just the fraughtness of when it's not going right was, and you know, I've seen investment partnerships. I mean, the case in Nick one was a great one, but in partnerships like that break up and that's kind of like worse than a divorce. No, maybe it's not worse than a divorce, but it's a kind of a divorce. And so um, that's why I've chosen the path that I have. I would tell you that the more time I spend talking to smart investors, I think the better I am for it. And we work hard at ensuring that I do that. So I have, in addition to Monish, at least 10 people that I that I want to talk to more often than I do, if you like. Um, and, you know, if, for, for the listener's interest, uh, uh, Steve and I met at Berkshire at, at a dinner, which, I mean, that dinner blew me away in terms of the, the, the knowledge around that table. I really, really enjoyed that. And if I could spend more time doing that, you know, I don't think I need an analyst. I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, and Chris Bloomstrand, if you're listening to this, we'd like to be invited back, both of us. So, <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, now, look, I, just this, this sort of brings us actually quite neatly to your investing rules. And one of your investing rules is check, check stock prices weekly or monthly. And I, I read you've got your Bloomberg in a different office or in a low and uncomfortable table. Mm -hmm. and you can go weeks without checking it at all. I, I find this slightly bizarre, odd, right? Because, <laughs> well, to me, the stock price is the most important signal. Yeah. Right? And if you don't check your stock prices, how do you know if something's happened? I mean, you know, how do you know that if a stock has fallen 10%, you need to know that because yeah. you need to be able to investigate it. Or if a stock, even something you don't own, Something that you're interested in has fallen ten percent, but that might be a better opportunity than something you own. So how I, I yeah, look, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I sat there with a Bloomberg screen and a watch list, and it was there one of two or three screens, depending on which place I was at, that was on all the time. I wasn't watching it yeah. in the minute to minute ticks, but I just needed to know if something had happened. I mean, and, my, and I, I had a dealing desk. If something yeah. bad happened, they would. They would yeah. be on me, but but my experience is, has been that when something happens, I do find out. But how? Uh, you know, I get emails in my inbox. I get analyses from somebody. I say the the news kind of finds me in a certain way, right. and um, so so you know somebody will and and it's and I think that maybe is it's being a slightly more prominent investor. Perhaps I I put up on my. Um, not every single company that my fund invests in, but I've put up on um, LinkedIn some of the companies I'm invested in. I just add as if it's a job description. I say investor in, you know, mm. and and then people think that I'm some private big investor. I'm just a portfolio investor. So I think that, that the feedback does come to me that way. I also think that it's really, really important in terms of what I'm invested in. I There are some businesses that change by the second or where you know you're in a biotech firm and they either get approval or they don't get approval but there are some uh, uh businesses which are kind of glacial in mm. terms of the pace of change and so so when if you decide that you're not going to be checking stock prices you're forced into these businesses which are absolutely glacial i a question that um just stuck with me that came up in one of these interviews that i printed out and read was i think it was charlie munger asking not Ted Wexler, but the other lieutenant, uh, you know, which of the, the members of the S&P 500 do you think will be a better business in five years? And I think that, you know, that, that question just struck with me because it's such a powerful question. And if you, just, if you just stick around businesses that you feel, that you believe, you have some confidence that they will be better businesses in five years, you only restrict yourself to investing in those, possibly, if, the, if you get a good price. You know, and it does mean that anything where things are happening on a monthly, weekly, half-annual basis are just outside of the... And there's a book by... His last name is Pulak, and Manish sent it to me recently. I Forgive me for not uh, remembering the full name. Um, but we'll he talks... Up. Pardon? We'll look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, and, and he talks about... 
uh, the evolution and how we're looking. The, so so the, there's this idea, I don't know a lot about evolution, and he goes into some analysis of it, of, of how at first Darwin kind of expected there to be sort of like a gradual drift in species from one thing to another. And as I understand it, and I hope I haven't gotten the idea completely wrong, the, the, the kind of the scientific consensus is that if evolution is punctuated, there are long periods of very little change, then change can happen unbelievably quickly. And so, you know, in a certain way, I think that his point is that why not look for businesses which are in these periods of status where the stasis where there are good businesses, but there's very, very little change for a very long time. And, you know, and I, it really bugs me because every time I figure one of these things out or a book like Pulax helps me to figure something out, I realize Warren already knows it because I think that probably Coca-Cola is an exemplary example of that where it's in kind of in status, stasis. It's been a great business for a very, very long time, continues to be a great business. So I think that here's an interesting perspective for you, Steve, is that if you're... Um, a biotech investor and Guy Spears saying, don't check the stock price, you, you're going to have your head handed to. If you're a biotech investor or all sorts of other industries, definitely check the stock price. But, but So you have to restrict yourself to certain kind of like very glacially changing businesses. I think that probably I've had my head handed to me because I, because I thought a business was glacial and it wasn't. Or I thought that it was definitely something that would be better in five years and it wasn't. And... Um, yeah, so, I mean, because, I mean, the, the the stock market tells you, gives you a, a report every day, which is quite useful, I, I find. And yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I understand that you're if you're having a, a you know very slow moving set of businesses, the problem with that is, of course, we're in a very fast changing world, and you know it might be a glacial change, and then all of a sudden something comes from left, left field, field that and, you didn't know about, expect yeah. or whatever, and then you. And then you have to pay attention. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I would say, I mean, it makes me think of a comment that Jeff Bezos made in a world where everything's is changing. Look for the things that aren't changing. And, you know, um, people like cheap stuff conveniently delivered. It would be one of the things that seems like Jeff Bezos found that wasn't changing. Uh, it's also it, it's it's a decision about how to live your life. So I think that um, Maybe I quite likely I have given up returns that I could have had if I'd been willing to look at a broader set of things uh, where things were changing more rapidly, and I've chosen that I don't want to live that life because it's kind of a stressful life. I also think that there's this a statement that um, Nassim Taleb has made. He made this comment. Well, it's not a comment. It's just in a. If you have a volatile market that's up, I think that uh, historically the market is up, maybe it's seven years out of 10, I'm not sure. But if you look at that, the volatility that creates that or the price movement that creates that, and you look at shorter and shorter time periods, the shorter the time period, the less likely the probability is that it will be up uh, in that particular time period. And so you look at the market over a broad sweep of 20 year periods, and there's very few periods where it's not up. And you shorten it and shorten it. And if you look at on on a on, on day by day or, or five minute um, uh, time section by five minute time section, it goes to 50 point XX 1% of the time it's up and 49 point dot dot dot. And if you have um, a asymmetry between what you feel when you see a gain, what you feel when you get a loss, certainly that says check the stock price less frequently. Um, and then the, the, you know what I would put to you, and I find this very, very hard, is that so you see uh, you, there's a piece of news, something's happened, there's price action, and then, um, you know, I have to decide whether that's significant or not. And I don't think that I'm capable of being rational very often in those kinds of circumstances because I, th I believe that I've seen far too many times uh, people, um, let, you know, they don't believe that the price action is instructing the analysis but that is actually what, what's happening. And too many times I've seen where I just ignore that, the market turns around and suddenly there's a different world and actually all the analysis that people had X weeks ago is completely turned on its head. And so the, the, the market plays really strange games with you and it's really dangerous, I think. To I understand that the stock price contains an enormous amount of information in it, but 
it's really dangerous for me to look at it regularly. And I think that I'm trying to create an environment. I really do believe this. I mean, I think that there are some people who maybe are more rational and are faster and quicker and better with the analysis. And I don't want to rely on that for myself. I want to actually rely on being the dumbest investor in the room and create an environment where the dumbest investor can actually win and succeed. Um, I don't want, I don't want to, I, I, you know, I'd like to believe that I'm intelligent, but I don't want to make my living off being intelligent. And I think there's an extraordinary mistake that some of the best analysts make and some of the smartest friends that I have is that they, they, they naturally gravitate towards situations where um, it's too hard for less smart people to figure out, but there with their prodigious and analytical capabilities and capacity to think through scenarios, they love that. But actually, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to be able to solve math problems. I've been playing a lot of chess recently. I'd like to be better at chess. But I'd like to divert or, or use that ability in that direction. And I'd love, I mean, you know, if you take Warren Buffett seriously, you know, invest in, any, in a business that any fool can run, because sooner or later one will, well, you know, one day I'd like, I might have dementia and I'd like to look smart in my job. So create that environment around me. No, that's a great uh, thing to, to take away because you know, the overly complex stuff people do love and it's never, it never works. I mean, if it's that complicated, the stock market will never work it out. So, yeah. you know, I always think exactly the same, you know, if it's a really complicated story, I'm not going to invest in it because how do, you know, you've got multiple ways of being wrong, yeah. first of all. Yeah. And second of all, how do you know that when is the stock market going to work there's, this out? And it, it, there's I, multiple I, plays, ways of being wrong. Uh, but you're still drawn into it and you're not even aware of the multiple ways it's being it, it might be wrong. And that, just going back to the analyst idea. So if you're an analyst, I, I find Value Investors Club a really, really interesting website because I think that many of the smartest analysts are on Value Investing Club. But if you're going to display your extraordinary talents as an analyst, you're not going to be able to do it with a really simple idea that works well. You know, I remember... And it's just a, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, but the way I met Nick Sleep is that I'm reading about Tom Russo and I see that he owns shares of this company, Weetabix. And I, I'm all over that. I know the Weetabix brand and it didn't take much market research to discover they had a 50% market share. I went and visited, it was a family owned business at the time, AIM traded. I went and visited them up somewhere outside in Cambridgeshire. And, you know, I had to, the guy knew that I was an investor, but I went in if you as a, it's the only people that would meet with you were quality control people. And they were willing to meet with people who consumed the brand on the quality control. But he knew I was an investor and he took me around and he showed me. Um, but the the write up was like one paragraph. You know, this is a this is a, um, a, a this is a brand, a serial brand that is beloved in the UK, has 50 percent market share. There's no way that anybody can compete with them. It's run like a family business. It has no debt and trades at four times earnings. Next question. And that's it. <laughs> There's nothing else to say. How's an analyst going to um, demonstrate how knowledgeable he or she is with that? So they, they, they get attracted to really, really complicated things. And that's a danger about having an analyst. They'll kind of want to show you how smart they are. And sooner or later, you might buy what they're showing you. Um, it's a very, very, the investing world is an extremely strange world because whatever's been figured out, you know, coming here, Steve, I was thinking about how little of what you teach is actually used by analysts today because, or what you used to teach, you may have updated your teaching in this way. Um, you know, quality of earnings, forensic looking at the notes to the company's accounts to try and understand which way they're biased. Are they ag aggressive on depreciation? Are they not aggressive? Are they... And, and, um, but that's not what passes for analysis these days. And in a certain way, I think we perhaps went through a period where everybody was doing that. And when everybody's doing that, and when there's a lot of knowledge in that area, and everybody's read security analysis, then the return on that goes down. And so I'm pretty sure that we'll come back but um, well, the good news is that nobody's been doing that for the last ten years, right? Because it hasn't worked. Right? Because, yes. because understanding, you know, that companies are becoming more aggressive made no difference to the stock price, and it's only no. now, as not, we enter the new regime, that this will become important again. Not only did it um, 
did it make no difference to the stock price, it probably actually hurt the stock price. <laughs> well, I mean, it hurt your performance because if you're yeah. paying attention to all this stuff that I worry about. Yeah. It, and, and you weren't buying, you weren't following Chamath into <laughs> the junk that he was floating. You were, you, you, your performance suffered. And so it's only now that, you know, real investors will, will come to the fore, I think. Yeah. I reckon, and yeah. and I, you know, my belief is that, and it'd be interesting to know if you, if you, I mean, you might not even have a view, but it's, you know, it's my belief we've had sort of forty years of falling rates, and I've been doing this presentation to various investment conferences, saying it's not just the forty years of falling rates; everything else has been a, a tailwind. You know, demographics, globalization, cheap imports from China, yeah. inflation, everything's going now going into reverse. Yeah. So, you know, your comment that. You know, if every, in, in most twenty-year periods, the stock market has gone up. Well, we might be in a period in which that For won't be time. true, and that, yeah. of course, makes things very much different. And th therefore, people will actually have to probably trade more because you have to buy things and see their value recognized, and then move on to the, to the next thing. And you you have to look at balance sheets, and our companies really is high quality as, yeah. as they appear. I don't know. Do you think about any of that stuff, or do you, do you just you're all bottom up? You don't care about the macro. Um, I mean, I I had the hardest time with, I mean, not so much macro, but these new ways of looking at uh, what the intrinsic value of the company is. And uh, the the time when it just really really struck me was when a friend took me through his valuation model for. Salesforce. And, you know, I saw a company that was not very profitable that dumped a huge amount of expenditure into marketing. And I've really enjoyed going to a Dreamforce event, a Dreamforce event that I went to in New York once. It's kind of like an amazing event with uh, all sorts of enrichment opportunities, of course. And so enormous amounts of marketing. And in order to sort of come to a conclusion that this company was cheap, you had to kind of make assumptions about how. Um, on the one hand, the churn of the customers, so that the natural turnover of the customers once they've been acquired was going to be below a certain, le certain level so that the customers you acquired through this enormous marketing expenditure uh, were worth, had a lifetime value, which was sort of like the, the cash flows from that customer would sort of like you could project them out 20 years. And you also had to have the assumption that at some point you switch off the marketing spigot. And so there's this kind of enormous cash flows to develop. And if you look at the history of Amazon, you know, I mean, you know, it's may, I don't know how many times this has worked, but Jeff Bezos realizes that he can make enormous investments today, take the profitability of the business down to very low zero or even negative, and um, that they are going to develop these extremely high cash flows 10, 15 years down the line. And that actually happened. <laughs> and now you've got a whole bunch of people looking for that all over the place. And so, um, you know, I mean, what I wrote about, and I, I wanted to find that myself. I so wanted to find it, and I, I just couldn't find one that made sense for me with the numbers. I think that, but, but to your point, I think that what, what happened to, to me in, in the last period is that I think that if you, if you kind of had some kind of training in accounting, looking at the inventories, looking at where the inventories are, how much capital is invested in the distribution channels, how much of the distribution channel. I mean, so many of those businesses. So I actually looked at one recently that I'm happy to talk about, a company called Mastercraft, which makes um, speedboats for um, uh, water skiing. And it's a relatively small business, market cap about $500 million. And basically, if you are, if you want to do water skiing right, you, I think, believe, I believe you have a choice of two brands. You have Mastercraft or Chriscraft, or only the really two brands. And even there, Mastercraft is the better brand for, you know, very, very um, people who really want to do water skiing right as a professional sport. And, you know, then you're kind of looking at how much product do they have in infantry, how much of the product is finished product, how much capital is really invested there. How much of the, all of those questions, those are really hard businesses. To, there, you really do want to do that analysis. And every now and then, you might come across a business where they've been incredibly conservative in the way they've reported all of that stuff. But that's hard work. And um, 
I found myself, for example, in the credit rating business, you don't have that. In the stock exchange business, you don't have that because they're kind of like, uh, you have an expense center and you have cash come in, basically. There's mm -hmm. none of that stuff. And so it, well, I think the dyed in the wool um, uh, financial analysts and accounting analysts have to accept is that they're, the proportion of businesses that have that kind of classic model of manufacturer's model with capital invested in the inventories and the distribution system is not the only model around. It is true, though, that if I if we look at Berkshire Hathaway, I think it's true to say that most of their operating businesses do have that model. And it's an interesting question why. And I, I think that part of the question why is that those moats are easier to analyze and they, they may ultimately be more durable, even if they're less exciting businesses to look at. It's fun to dive into that with you a little bit because I think you have an enormous amount of expertise there. And I think it's still great stuff to teach. And... I think that many analysts, yeah, they probably haven't done it ever. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the people don't like to read the accounts. That's a simple fact, right? Chris, Chris Bloomstrand does. Oh, Chris he definitely does. Yeah, but I mean, he's, yeah. he, he's an exceptional analyst. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you know... I think that more people would enjoy reading the accounts if they knew what they were looking for. Well, we can, if you if you would enjoy reading the accounts, if you knew what you were looking for, we have a solution for you. So I don't even need to put the advert in for this <laughs> for this podcast. But um, listen, uh, we're, we're coming to the to, to point where we probably should close, and I hope we're going to do this again because I've got uh, I've, as often I've as written all like. these questions down, and I, it seems a shame to bin them, well, especially um, with our wonderful sound engineer. Yeah, well, absolutely. So. Just um, one thing on your rules that just, the other thing I, I I really disagreed with was the management. I really you appreciate that you like, disagree with it. That's first of all, that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. That's great. No, no. Well, I, I mean, I, I, look, there's no right way of doing investing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the beauty. It's the marvelous thing about it is that everybody does it in their own way. Everybody's very, very different, and you can make money in all sorts of ways, but. If you don't talk to management, how do you know that you can trust them? It was a very dumb thing that I wrote in the book. And uh, I'm eight years on from it. And uh, if I was to write a new edition, uh, that is something. In fact, I, I would say that one of the, uh, there's very little that pains me about having written the book. And I'm proud of it. And I'm delighted that it's had an impact. Uh, but it pains me that some people will read that and think that that's what Guy Spear thinks today. And, and not only is it not what I think today, I think that I've had some enormous losses because I applied that rule. And I think that I can go back and I can do it now a little bit and maybe if we do a second edition, I can kind of think about it in more depth. Um, what was it that led me to such a clearly wrong conclusion. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm happy. You know, there may be some things that you vehemently disagree with. I mean, checking the stock price, I think we're in different places there. But, um, and the, the analogy that I've used is that I think that part of my fear of talking to management is that I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm uh, hyper aware of my capacity to be duped, say, of to be, to be taken in by a nice story. But, you know, that's similar to saying that a chainsaw can cause enormous injury. But if you need to cut down a few trees, what are you going to do? Take out a pen knife? Of course, you've got to take out the chainsaw and you damn well better learn how to use it well and safely. And so it is, it is talking to management is fraught with opportunities for getting the wrong end of the stick, being duped by the story, being misled, being pointed in a direction where they don't want you, where they want you to look, but not, they may be duping themselves. It may be, not be nefarious. They may just themselves not want to look in a particular place. And so they kind of reinforce something. But the fact of the matter is, it, the management team is a nexus of enormous amounts of knowledge and insight at, about the company. And you would be absolutely nuts not to talk to them. And I also think that it's, when I'm, it's much easier to read a book in French or to learn French when you're in France. Can you intend to learn French sitting here in London or somewhere else? Yes, but you'll do, you'll be far more efficient in France. Maybe all I do is visit, I mean, just to take a, probably a trite way of looking at it, but, you know, if, if, 
maybe I go to Atlanta and all I do is walk around outside the headquarters of Coca-Cola because for one reason or another I can't get inside, but that's going to stimulate me to think more clearly about Coca-Cola, say, than if I'm not in Atlanta. So I think that just going and kicking the tires in one way or another, the story that I tell about this one bankruptcy that was in my portfolio is that I believe that if I'd have gone and visited the plant and just talked to people outside, I would have it's far more likely that I would have come to the decision that this was not something that was right for my portfolio. So so you you're jumping through an open door and um I think it's really, you know, um we when we when when we grow and learn, we change our opinions. And so changing one's opinion is a good thing. And yeah, I I don't know what idiot would write that in a book on investing and uh and I fundamentally disagree with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. quite funny, and I know credit to you for for changing your mind. I mean, I I think that you know, because what I was going to say is that, I mean, when you first go and invest, just the you can first of all you can learn quite a lot from the management, and you the way they think about their yeah. own business yeah. can tell you a lot because they they know more about it than you do. Yeah. But when you want to own shares for a long time, the having a constant dialogue when I say constant but you know meeting the management every year yeah and checking that what they said last year has come true yeah and checking that they aren't changing their story yeah because if you're going to own a stock and you know I've owned stocks for m multiple years I mean I worked for hedge funds but yeah. they were very fundamentally driven hedge funds and we didn't have any reason why we wouldn't own a stock for five years yeah and if you're going to own a stock for five years, you know, at some point, it's quite likely that you will want to sell that stock because there's another opportunity yeah. or because the, the, the results aren't coming through. But you might also want to sell the stock because you think the strategy is drifting yeah. or you think that there's, there's something that you don't feel comfortable about. And I think that checking in with the management, yes. how's it going? And of course, the longer you own the stock, the closer you'll come to the become yeah. the management and they'll trust you and you can also have an influence on the way the business is, is run. Yeah. You, can, you can mention the ideas that you've got and so you're actually get, being a positive influence but the feedback I think is, is, is in, and enormously important. It is and I think that one thing that I would add to that is that and for the benefit of anybody who's uh, new to this is make make and it's easiest to talk about this in American companies where I understand the reporting cycles the best, is that remember that the press release is considered to be informal statements that were mentioned at a conference talking. The, the standard of reporting that comes through in a 10K, which is prepared, or a, a, a 10Q, which is prepared by lawyers and accountants, and the statements made in the, in the 10K and the Q and in the in the in the in the, um, uh, in the financial statements have to be far more carefully looked at. And so, not only what the management as team is saying from year to year, but what are they saying relative to what's in the statements and what's being left out? And I, I think that just this idea of collecting, understanding things in the right order, look for the written, look for those authoritative documents first before you go to the non-authoritative documents. Often there, there are significant differences between what the press release says and what the um, 10K or Q says because of those different standards and you get a sense of where the management is kind of pushing. And then when you take that into account with that background, now you ask the management questions or you see how they respond to questions on conference calls, you can get a sense of whether they're dealing with reality or not, whether they're kind of trying to puff things up or whether they're trying to take things down. And so... You're absolutely right. And um, I think that my bias there is that my the, the, the sort of the module in my brain that evaluates people is really not that good in comparison to others. So I have a deep seated desire to want to shy away from it. But in this particular and I think that it's good to focus on the things that you're good at and to leave other things to people, other people who may be good at those things. In this case, it's something where I actually have to make a little bit more effort. I don't like writing as much as I like doing numbers, but I have to make a little bit more effort if I want to communicate well. This is something where I 
sometimes you can focus on your strength and sometimes you have to say, well, this is something that even though I'm not that good at it, I need it. <laughs> well, I mean, just because you're not good at it doesn't mean to say that you can't do, you know, that you should ignore it. Yes, I mean, correct. you might not be as good as somebody else, but yeah. you can, it's, and it's a skill you can develop. I mean, you meet enough managers and get lied to often enough, then, you know, you can remember the guy yeah. who lied to you and, and it's, it's also a fascinating thing that I think is maybe true of life, but it's certainly true in financial markets, is that if you ignore your weakness, it's, it, it might come and clobber you when you're not looking. But if you say, this is something that I'm not very good at, it is a weakness for me, then, then in a way it can become a strength because, because now you're allowing for it. And, and this pattern seems to emerge time and time again in investing. Um, and you can also train. I mean, I, I'm I'm still a bit um, irritated because COVID came and interrupted the the development of we did we were developing a new product. So I'd found this guy who trains policemen in interrogating suspects, and so he's brilliant at body language. Yeah. And I I agreed with him that we would do a course for investors. Yeah. So in fact, one of my invest one of my investor clients had said to me, "Oh." You know, do you know anybody? Could you do? Could you do as this course? Now I found this guy just by accident, and um, I thought, brilliant! This is going to be, and I thought it'd be really fun for me as well. Right? Yeah, that we'd do this course about how do you interview a manager and how do you tell? You know, how do you phrase the questions? How do you tell if he's lying? And um, unfortunately, the guy had his his personal circumstances changed during COVID, and we now can't do that course. So I'm looking for the the, the right person. To replace them, and we do we we do a little bit of this in my forensic accounting course. But we do a bit about the psychological makeup of people that lie, right? And, and managers that lie. And so, right. how do you how do you um, work that out? And you know, what sort of questions do you ask? Because people aren't very good at asking questions. But we're we've got to two of your eight rules, so you'll need yeah. to come back. But the, <laughs> the the closing question we always ask everybody is is there a book or a practice that you would recommend to a young person thinking of becoming an analyst or an in investor yeah so um so i've had some time to prepare from that and before i get into that i just it's just come up for me and i just want to share it you'll get a preview of some of what steve and i will talk about uh hopefully at a at a, at a really enjoyable lunch because i haven't spent nearly enough time talking to steve and I, i'm looking forward to doing it offline as well but I met a guy who's a former intelligence officer and uh, he was just meeting me in my office and I kind of had asked him a similar question. I'd kind of said, look, I think that what you do in your world has huge implications for investors and we haven't really started to kind of investigate that and there are no real books that I can read. So he, um, he'd read my book and he says... Oh, yeah. And I love the fact that you wrote about meeting Warren Buffett and talking about your car. It was a Ferrari, wasn't it? And I kind of jumped on him. It was him a said, Porsche. Correct. And he said, he, and, and he said, aha, you see, that's, that's, that's where we start trying to figure people out. So I deliberately introduced that mistruth. And I wanted to see how you reacted to it. Did you accept it or did you let it go by? And, uh, and th th that's just like sort of... Um, uh, it's a fascinating idea in meeting with the management team to introduce something that flatters their business and see if they correct it or not. You know, to see well, that tells you something. Uh, uh, and I didn't realize there's a kind of a proactive way in which they do it. So it's kind of like I, I think that some of the most brilliantly psychologically genius people are in that world. And I think you're absolutely right to try and figure out what can apply to investing. And so. Um, you know, happy to share that person's name with you and maybe we can collaborate on that. But um, so in terms of books, I, I, I think that what I, I, you know, William Green collaborated with me on my book. I don't want to appear on your podcast without having talked about William Green's book. It's an absolutely wonderful book, which takes you through the minds of some of the greatest investors around today. And William spend enormous amounts of time with them. You've interviewed him. So uh, I, I wanted to mention that. But then I just wanted to give a facetious answer, which I think is actually really helpful. And so the, the answer is, which book would particularly help a, a, somebody who's getting into this? And the answer is all of them. And my point to the listener is, 
in the same way that we've had, we, we talked a little bit about how seeing somebody's investment moves without seeing the full psychological picture and without seeing the full balance sheet is not really particularly helpful. Potentially, it can be misleading. I would say that what's more important is not what I say is a great book, uh, but that you should go to the library and start pulling out 20, 30 books and start figuring out what is the right book for you in that moment. And when I say all of them, if you have an intent to make progress, your job is to get as many candidate books as possible. Unfortunately, you can't read them all in parallel and try and figure out through a process of rapid elimination what is right for you to read right now and develop in a certain way your own reading program and realize that even if uh, a book is going to be really, really good for you, it might not be the first book that you should read. And so I think that the best learners and the best readers through their experience of reading something develop an intuitive sense of what if it's right for them right now. And if it is right for them, they'll continue to read. But it may be that what you want to do is dip and then put it aside and go to something else. And I think that that capacity to kind of like decide what your diet will be and feed yourself that diet and update your knowledge of what that meta knowledge of what the diet is and where to go is super, super important. And um, realize that so what, what I recommend is not going to be the most important thing. And I think that a lot of the time, people in my shoes in a conversation like this will want to recommend something that is recognized as being a good recommendation but may not actually end up being the best recommendation for you. As Steve told me, there's a wonderful, I really enjoyed, so short story about William Green. So William Green wrote Which Are Wiser Happier. He also collaborated with me on my book in which I had a finished manuscript, which was pretty crappy. It would have passed muster with the publisher. And then William and I went through a project which took about three or four months of rewriting most of it and making it way, way, way better. But there were many moments when what William had to do after having worked through the existing text and interviewed me was rewrite it. And he would go away and rewrite it. And he would go gray. And he had to do that. And, uh, and I'd say I'd be sort of like wandering around upstairs and you know, this this baby of mine is now in his hands and extremely, extremely good hands. I'd be like, well, what am I supposed to do? And I tried my hand once at editing his writing, which was a totally disastrous thing to do. So William would say to me derisively, say, well, why do you just work on the bibliography? <laughs> so there I am upstairs in uh, Zurich working feverishly on the bibliography while William is creating chapters of great beauty out of my original writing. And, um, and so the bibliography is worth looking at. And, and, and you know, um, maybe another way of answering the question, I hope you're okay with me being so discursive, such a long answer to such a simple question, I could have just given a, a book, is um, something that my daughter asked me. So my daughter's currently learning Italian in Rome and she's trying to pick electives for her first year of university, and she has to do a language. She's wondering if she'd do a language with, that she already knows, or if she'd do a new language that she doesn't know. And so like the options like Sanskrit, Japanese, uh, Russian. And I strongly urged her. I kind of said, look, it all depends on the teacher, who else is in the class, all of those good things. But I just think building the broadest base possible. Uh, so, you know, I urged her, she, I, kind of, Sanskrit sounds like fun to me. I mean, I told her the more she progresses in life, the less like she is to do these kind of random big jumps. And so, you know, my urge to the reader is, you know, approach a text, not saying is this something that some authority has told me is a good text to read, is what can I learn from this text that is going to help me? Maybe you're going to come across something that none of the other people have. And, and that's kind of fun and interesting. And, and, I have. I think that that applies to literature as well. Tyler Cohn has written a fascinating thing where he said, um, uh, you know, literature is an interesting laboratory for economists. So uh, when when authors, great authors, have written really interesting stories, there may be interesting lessons that one can learn. And so I, I, I you know, I would not restrict it to fiction, and just develop that sixth sense of whether this thing is right for you right now. It's a long way of not answering the question. But boy, I'm really good at taking a long time to say nothing while not answering the question, but trying to be entertaining. So thank you for listening to me. Well, no, uh, th thanks are all mine. Thank you so much for coming on. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, we didn't have enough time in, in Omaha, but we have a little bit more time now. 
thank you so much. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure, Steve, and um, I'm looking forward to having more conversations with you, online and offline. Well, I could have chatted for much longer with Guy. I only got about a third of the way through my list of topics, and we went on to chat for much longer over lunch and over coffee. Guy spent almost all of that conversation making constructive and interesting suggestions as to how I could improve my business, and I was grateful for that. Guy's attitude to money was colored by his family's experience in Germany before the Second World War. Understanding such attitudes can help you become a better investor. I was interested in Guy's philosophy of investing in companies that change glacially slowly. It's certainly a lower risk route. Guy has thought extensively, not just about investing, but about how to live a better life. As with my conversations with William Green and Vitaly Katzenelson, I probably learned as much about life as about investing from these discussions. And that was one of the goals of the podcast, to learn about the world of investing and the world at large. I really enjoyed talking to Guy and hopefully he'll come back and we can continue the conversation. Thanks as ever for listening. And please share this conversation with all your friends and please leave a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thank you for listening. I'm Steve Clapham. That was the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and why not visit our website, behindthebalancesheet.com, where you can find the show notes and lots of other videos which can help you on your investing journey. Thank you for watching.